Hello and welcome back to the podcast. So we're going to be buying a little bit of time for Joe Perez. He said that his speaking engagement this morning got pushed back. So he may be, I don't know, five, 10 minutes late. But we do have an update with our marketing strategy. Actually, update's the wrong word. I, I would say we had a breakthrough. Yeah, I think this is uh, pretty revolutionary if you ask me. So Hunter, tell me w what's going on with this. Seems like we have uh, an increase in clicks to cost or, or a in the ratio. So something's going right. Right. Well, okay. I guess let's back up for those of you who are watching the podcast, but not the um, lecture series that I'm, I'm recording on Tuesdays with my Greensboro College class. Um, we can look at, so here is the ad strategy we ran for the past, I think it was the past two weeks. So we can look at this. Let's look over the past month and see what this, these numbers look like. Okay, so it looks like August 25th through August 31. Um, okay, so that's not not much time. But look at the look at the ratio of cost to clicks here. Yeah, I mean it's pretty. pretty uh, could be better. I'll say that could be better. <laughs> um, yeah, so we incurred seventy dollars worth of costs for twenty three dollars in clicks. But coming back to um, where is it? So we're also pivoting what we're marketing. So instead of marketing the course directly, we are marketing um, the lecture series. Oh, okay. So let's do the last seven days. All right. So yeah, that we're getting a huge return on investment here. But let's let, let's like actually take a look at the demographics. So Hunter, if you, you see this map right here, what do you think is going on? It seems like we have an increase in people from uh, over in India who are right. uh, catching on. Right. Well, I think what what we're doing is we're getting much lower cost per clicks. But I'm wondering, so, I mean, this is so fascinating because we started out with it cost us $10 to get one click. Then in the last ad campaign, like the last test, we got it down to $1. Now it's like $0.10 cents per click. But I think we might have over, like over optimized on that one specific KPI, because I'm wondering if people in India are willing to spend two hundred to hundred dollars on a course. So maybe we're over optimizing specifically on cost per click. Oh, that's interesting. So it's like the 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 cost is lower because just the the, the region. Right. Well, I think it's like uh, there are multiple things going on. So the discrepancy, the the uh, disposable income in India is probably much lower than in the United States. But also, too, you have the currency working um, against the people in India to buying our course. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so also, I mean, if we take a look up at Hunter. All right. I'm going back into professor mode. Hunter, <laughs> interpret this device little widget visualization right here. Um, well, I'm assuming that it's probably measuring um, clicks. Okay. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. So it says clicks, impressions, impressions views. views. Mobile is blue. Tablets red. Computers are yellow. And TV screens are green. Yeah. So it seems like people who are viewing us on the computers or on tablets are not really. Uh, we're not getting a lot of click through on that, but people who are. People who view us on mobile are then becoming impressions and clicks. Okay, so you gotta. It's it's. I don't like the the order in which they laid out the bars. Yeah. Because it should be impressions, then views, then clicks. Because you have an impression before you have a have a view. Okay, so do you want to talk about? Okay, what it, what is an impression then in this? So an impression is someone seeing the ad, and okay. then a view is someone viewing it. So they click on. So yeah, they I'm see not... the ad. They click on the ad to like to like make it full screen or something. And then, so yeah, I'm I'm not quite a hundred percent sure on what an impression is within Google Ads, but on YouTube, an impression is like if you're on YouTube.com and you see someone's thumbnail, that is an impression. If they click okay. on it, then that it turns into a view. Although, okay, so I guess it is a different situation on Google Ads because you you have a view and then you click on the ad to go see the other the, what they're promoting. But what, so, what's, what's I don't popping? Guess, I don't guess you think it, it, it could be like if somebody presses skip, then it's just an impression. 
but if somebody watches the whole thing, it's ah, of I think that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, these are the five second skippable. Yeah. Ads. Check check hover over impressions. How many impressions are there there? Yeah. Okay. That's that a makes lot. sense. Hundred a hundred thousand people have seen our ads in the last two days. That is. That's Pretty actually cool. that's actually a lot of people. Wow. Dr. Joe, how's it going? <laughs> Good morning, or good afternoon, I should say. Doing great. How are you guys? Good. So we were, yeah, we were buying some time looking at, um, we just pivoted our ad strategy, um, which is relevant for our talk today, because we were talking about using data to drive decisions. But um, awesome. we, we just started, instead of just doing YouTube ads, we're now starting to do um, video display ads, which are, they seem to really be working. Because I mean, look at the amount... We've had 2,600 clicks in the past two days. And Holy smokes. Yeah, and much less views than on the display network than the YouTube video. So there's something that we've hit on here. Um, but I guess, yeah, so what we're what we're promoting is that that channel intro video. And it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, dumping people to this specific playlist. So what we're trying to do is get people to watch our, um, I'm, I'm live streaming half of my lectures at Greensboro College this right. semester. So it's dumping them to this specific playlist. And what's mm -hmm. awesome is some people have already, within the past two days, have already watched like four and a half hours worth of uh, our lectures, which is insane. That's wonderful. Well, famous guy like you, hey, who wouldn't <laughs> want to do that, right? <laughs> ah, so, all right. So how about... Um, you just kind of introduce yourself. I, I know that we're going to be talking about using data to drive decisions, but I'm kind of curious, uh, Dr. Perez, what was your talk about earlier this morning? Well, I talked about the actionability of data and my apologies. That's why I was late um, speaking oh, at another conference right before this, this engagement. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I talked about um, making data actionable, how, blending um, that, you know, as Spencer Sobzak has said, uh, data storytelling is both an art and a science. Our data visualizations are the most powerful when they find this balance. And that's precisely what I talked about. It is balancing art and science, beauty and brains, form over function, or is it function over form, <laughs> or should they both be blended to get the right mix, you know? And so I took people on a journey from uh, from their concept, uh, yeah, they have an idea. They got something in their head the way they want to report on the data. It, it's just in their head, but how are they going to get it from their head to where somebody else can look at it and gain insight from it and make decisions from the concept to the reality? And so yeah. I take them through that spectrum and talk about talked about the uh, best practices in uh, in doing so. So uh, we're totally in, yeah, we're totally in alignment here because uh, in this the. I'm teaching case studies and business analytics, a, a class mm -hmm. at Greensboro College right now. And for our final, instead of a test, they are building out a Tableau public portfolio. And guess what the two metrics in which I grade them on are? Art and science. Form and function. Form and function. Oh, okay. Yeah. Form and function. <laughs> right. Yeah. Awesome. So, Because I think awesome. that it, it also depends on who, uh, who you're presenting to as well. Because I think some... Some of your end users are going to want something more visually striking to where others, like if you're working with uh, the CFO, he's used right. to working with very dry tables. And if you throw in a <laughs> bunch of visualizations, it's actually going to grate on his aesthetic, like palette or taste. Right. Because that's not what he's used to using, you know? Right. Yeah. So are you currently consulting or just, are you, you're working full time now, right? I'm working full time. Yes, sir. I'm a senior systems analyst and team lead at the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Oh, nice. So what um, are you using? How are you using data to drive your decisions there? If you can share, I don't know if that's sure. Yeah, right. no, absolutely. Uh, it's not like, uh, you know, I work for the Department of Defense. And uh, <laughs> if I told you, I would have to shoot you. type thing. You <laughs> know, right? <laughs> yeah, that would be my brother in law. But I won't get into that. All right. um, yeah, so. The, uh, the idea behind it is uh, Health and Human Services uh, offers benefits, okay? And uh, because of that, in the climate of not wanting to spend too much money or to be wise in the tax dollars that do get spent, 
uh, the, the the allocation of funds and and the results for it, you know, outcome based, uh, results based, uh, looking at okay, what are the results? What are the outcomes? Are we indeed spending the money wisely? In looking at how these benefits are allocated to people, you know, are people getting the benefits that they need? Are they getting the benefits that they deserve? Is it being done in an equitable fashion? Is it being done with a minimum of waste? Uh, are these people effectively serving the state of North Carolina? How long does it take to respond to certain types of calls? Um, the placement of kids in homes, the distribution of benefits, the uh, investigation of complaints and so on and so forth. And, you know, you can say, all right, well, um, according to these anecdotal uh, evidences that we have, the way people talk, the things that people say, we can say that this county's effective, this county's not effective or whatever, relying only upon hearsay and stories and, and anecdotes. I'm talking about, uh, you know, anecdotal evidence. Look at it, say it that way. Uh, or more accurately, start looking at just uh, verifiable, quantifiable means, right? Uh, performance measures that can indeed be measured um, against some standard and say, okay, over time, you know, then not only do you have that measure for the present, but if you've been gathering those same measures over time, then you can start deriving some sort of pattern, some sort of trend, right? So it's all about uh, teasing out data points, teasing out quantifiable, measurable means of measuring performance <laughs> and teasing out trends within those KPIs, the key performance indicators, um, so that those that are in charge of allocating these resources and assigning people to do X, Y, and Z will be able to make informed decisions rather than just going with our gut, right? You know, I mean, if you got, if you got a good feel for your business flow, you know, if we're talking about business decisions, right? You got a good feel for your business flow, your your supply and demand, your uh, employee, um, the 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 duties that your employees are doing, the efficiency of what they're doing, the efficiency of your process, the efficiency of your of your sales, your engagement with your customers, and that kind of thing. Then, yeah, you're going with your gut by saying, okay, I know my business. I'm going to base my decisions based on my knowledge of the business, but. All these different pieces of information that you're getting and using, what are they other than data to help drive your decision? So, yeah, you go with your gut, but that gut needs to be informed. So right? can we, um, let's make this really concrete because you said something that really um, resonated with me. Um, so you said something about response times. Mm -hmm. Hunter, you know where I'm going with this, don't you? Is it related to the... The, the fire data is that what yeah so on? okay so hunter is partnering or volunteering with this uh, local organization called code for greensboro and mm -hmm. he is looking at fire response time data so can we get really really concrete on what like as i mean it's funny because we just kind of stumbled upon this opportunity here like as a analyst in kind of the public health space how how might hunter or his team or his volunteer group analyze that data to uncover some insights that's valuable for the community so actually also i want to tack on to that so you had mentioned the you'd mentioned the anecdotal part and the data driven part i think right. oftentimes people set aside the anecdotal stuff because it's not maybe not as you mentioned as quantitative um but i in my experience so far oftentimes the stuff that is anecdotal is actually part of the story of of the data absolutely do you, do you want to talk a little bit about that as well Oh, absolutely. Yes, because see, a lot of people think that quantitative and qualitative data are mutually exclusive of each other. And while if you just look at a textbook definition, yeah, maybe so. Uh, as far as textbook definitions are concerned, yes, qualitative and quantitative are mutually exclusive. However, no, there is absolutely no reason at all to exclude the the, the anecdotal stuff, the qualitative stuff, um, because I think that qualitative data can be quantified. And for that matter, quantitative data can be qualified, too. <laughs> you know, they both ought to be used together. 
the, the, the only point was not to rely solely on the qualitative stuff, you know, that they needed something measurable and quanti quantifiable. Uh, but yeah, no, absolutely. I, I agree that that, um, uh, that the qualitative needs to be, needs to be included. Yeah. So that's something, that's something that I experienced when I was working through. So this, this Greensboro fire data that we were working with, mm -hmm. um, oftentimes there, there might be a, there in in the analytics of it there might be like a, a seeming a seemingly you know correlation oh uh, maybe at um, in October the call response times are faster well it's like let's let's examine that further there's, right what what happened in the previous year was were there also events that happened in October were they all related to fire alarms were they related to a different kind of call? It's it's stuff it's stuff that you need to look at, and I think there's a story that needs to be told before you can just rely solely on what the data says. I agree 100 percent. See, that's the thing of a good data visualization and having a good, robust bits of data that have been uh, that have been gathered. What should it make you do? It should always make you ask more questions. You know, you see that particular trend, a blip or a dip, right? <laughs> you know, blip or dip, whichever way it goes, up or down. Why did it go up or down? Is there additional detail that you can that you can look at that will guide you to say, okay, why did this happen? What are the contributing factors? Is it a contributing factor? Is it an exacerbating factor? Is it a mitigating factor? Which one, you know? And so Oops. that's what um, uh, that's what it should do. And, and that's the, if you will, the marriage or the leveraging together of both the qualitative and the quantitative. You know, the quantitative is going to show you the blip. The qualitative might just tell you why that blip occurred or, you know, uh, at least uh, guide you to um, uh, to seek additional insight and dig deeper into the data that you have. All right, so we have been neglecting our chat, and I feel like I've, I've been so bad at this. I've been a neglectful host. So, Gabir, welcome. Also, Yesbel. Isabel. Yeah, Yesbel. Isabel. It's just Isabel. A, Isabel? It's Isabel, yeah. Yes, right. Okay. Isabel. Uh, maybe we're better off not bringing people in. Come on, Josh. Raj. Thanks, Noor. Gerson, Siam. Thank you guys so much for. Uh, Tune in live, and then Stony. It's like we have our first kind of conversation All right. point. Stony. So Stony says you can use specific anecdotal examples to personalize the story of patterns or results that you found from analyzing data, as you would complement a visualization with expo explanatory text. Doctor Perez, would you agree with that? Absolutely. freaking lutely. <laughs> and then, oh he, yeah, he's got even more. So show yeah, them yeah, together. yeah. Stakeholders like will Stoney. understand the results better and give you examples along with the graphs and the tables. So right. I think that's interesting of making it, um, and I feel like I just used this quote, and I don't know who said it, but it was like about World War One or two. Uh, mm -hmm. one, one specific death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. So it's like you make it personalized, but then also kind of show the scope of things. Yes. And I think that's what you can do with having specific anecdotes to say kind of like, here is the, Here's a face you can put behind the story or a specific Absolutely. narrative thread. Yeah, you have to have both. You need the concrete, quantifiable, measurable numbers to show what's happening. Express it in a visually compelling manner so people can see the picture and gain the insight. But all that you've done there, you have made it relevant OK, you need to make it resonant as well. Right. You're appealing to the mind when you look at the numbers, but you appeal to the heart when you look at the story behind it. You know, uh, and that, again, is the art and science, so to speak. The science. Show me just the numbers. The art. What is the story behind it? What is the face behind the story? You know, what is the story behind the number? What is the face behind the story? What's the situation behind the face? You make it personal. You make it relatable. You make it resonate with the people that are making the decisions and they can empathize a little bit more and, and you know, have a, a fuller, richer picture of what they're um, what they're trying to look at. Okay, so that makes total sense for me kind of in the public health space, but mm -hmm. like uh, me and Hunter are starting to work on consulting projects with the uh, owners of businesses. 
how do we, I mean, because a lot of this, these numbers are just dry. It's like, here are the sales in the Northeast. Here are the sales in the Southeast. You know, here is the average order value. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. It, it feels like a bit of a stretch for me to be like, and here's your perfect buyer persona. And this is what they do. And like, how, how do you pull at an executive or a decision maker's heartstrings? Because it that right. I, it, I get it in like the, you know, this person is starving or, you know, this this, this person's house is, is on fire. But, you know, yeah. like, you might lose $10,000 if you don't do this. Like, that's not that's not really pulling at the heart. Or maybe right. it is. It might. Yeah. So it's all in, you know, how much what is the OK. Um, too many people concentrate on making the the charts and the reports look pretty. All right. Mm -hmm. it, rather than in the data gathering phase, you know, how robust is the data that has been gathered? Uh, the more you get, the more you can pull, the more you can right. pull, the more you can stratify, the more that you can stratify, the more than you can gratify, <laughs> the more than you can gratify, then the better situation you're going to have overall. Because once you say, okay, so let's talk about sales. Um, uh, sales in the Southeast, we sold 38,000 in the Southeast last, you know, big whoop. You're going to go to sleep with it. All right. So dig, what else do you know? Well, you also know that last month it was greater than the previous month. Why was it greater? What additional insight can you derive from it? Was it driven by some event? Was it driven by some one of the products? You know, you, you dive into it and say, look at the different product lines. Uh, was it because a particular new product came out or something dipped? Was it because the other products were better and were more innovative? Or was it one particular product that kind of sucked, you know, and that it was bad? Uh, it wasn't so bad. It was mediocre, but all the others were so much better. Or all of them were fairly decent and one champion uh, was much greater than all, right? Once you get that, then you dig into that and say, okay, well, what was it? Was it? Was its benefits touted uh, in advertising more effectively than those of the others? And in reality, you find out the other products were just as good. They just weren't as well advertised. Or was it some um, manufacturing technique that was more efficient and therefore drove the price down, drove the demand up, and people just wanted more of it? You know, what are the details that go into it? And then once you look at that, then you have a much richer picture. You know, do I look at the results of my advertising? Do I look at the results of my product development? Do I look at the results of my manufacturing? Do I look at the results of how complaints of customers who had originally said six months earlier that um, the, 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 the ledge on the end wasn't long enough. And so that caused them to change the way they were making it to address this customer complaint. Okay. Among those customer complaints, were there more of them uh, from a particular region? Well, that doesn't matter to people in warmer climates because they don't need that extra thing. You know, people in colder climates. See, so, you know, you start piecing those those parts of the story together. And when you couple that with, say, there's some survey of these customers that bring in these complaints or these compliments, whatever, if it's a compliment or a complaint, positive, negative, whatever, you get the feedback. It, it's no good to just get the feedback if you don't do anything about the feedback, if you don't catalog it, if you don't um, capitalize on it, if you don't right. try somehow to derive some <clears throat> sort of pattern or insight. If um, you're not driving a decision. Yeah, um, exactly. What's so, Hunter, I feel like, all right, with this client that we just signed, the it's almost like a, you need to seduce them with data. Like you need to get them like pulled in because like I, I it's weird because I'm going through this weird metamorphosis where I'm getting out of like the analyst seat. Like Hunter is kind of replacing where I was the past five years um, like doing the doing the heavy lifting of um, consulting. And now I'm a business owner and I have I have more things than I can feasibly do in a day. So what you can what you can <laughs> position yourself in as a problem solver or you're kind of a center of waste or like a time suck and energy vampire. Um, I think what's already happened with this this cons this customer we just signed, they've already been seduced by Tableau and they realize that their millions of dollars 
just like millions of dollars of opportunities just lying dormant in their organization. Mm -hmm. If they can just bring it all into one infrastructure, then we can get it kind of codified. And then I think that something that Hunter, you're actively working on right now is the UI, right? Yeah. So it's it's connecting to a live data source, um, setting up an interactive KPI dashboard that's that's constantly updating. It, it it's not something that they're going to need to go back into and constantly, you know, like like how in Excel sometimes you'll have to, oh, I need to go to line three hundred thousand and change this or whatever. It's it's right. like yeah, it's it's all it's all constantly updating. Uh, there's there's parameters that let people within their organization see it or people not see it. Um, and then it's finally, once you get the basic infrastructure set up so that it's all functional, how can you, how can you make it? it, it okay. You say, you say, make it pretty. I, I prefer the term, uh, uh, fluid. How does it all, yeah. how does all of the different, uh, KPIs on the dashboard, uh, connect with each other? How do they all communicate with each other to tell a specific uh, direction that the data is going? You know? It's yeah. Like and also too, it's, it's you're in, you're what you're doing is you're empowering the decision maker in that organization to pull up yes. their mobile app, click on this thing and get the exact piece of data that's salient for the decision that they're making right there. That is kind of the seduction piece where like as a business owner, right. I'm starting to see things that are popping up that it's like, I, I keep put, I, I keep, I've noticed this is a bad behavior. I need to break it. I'll put it on my calendar and then I'll, it'll come up in the day and I'll be like, mm, let's put it to tomorrow. And then let's put yeah. it to tomorrow. <laughs> there are certain things that Pushing I keep putting back. off. And I think a yeah. lot of business owners are putting off like analysis or a lot of decision makers because they don't want, well, number one, and I think that this is a huge thing we can, this is a topic alone that we could talk about is they don't either trust their analysts or they don't trust their data to make their mm -hmm. own decision. Cause it's like, well, the data collection is wrong. And that's just the whole nat, uh, rat's nest of just problems right there. Or they just don't have access to it. Like they don't, they would have to go through and like pull the data from the system, uh, combine a bunch of uh, sheets together with a V lookup and then do an analysis that's only good one time because if they want to repeat that process, they're going to have to go back and get the data. Step one, yeah. reassemble it all again, right? All right, so we we got some questions coming in. Cool. All right. Well, it looks like so Nor Nor is asking. Okay, well, Stony. You know, all right, let's go in order. So because we've yeah. got Stony, Stony came on like what three three weeks ago or something like that. Yeah. So he's saying you only have ten minutes of attention. You should have a supplemental material that you make available before the meeting that contain more details along with the table of contents. Interesting. What do you think? Okay. That, that feels like giving them homework. So that's a bit of a, a controversial point. It is, but you know, okay. Okay. So if you've only got 10 minutes that you're going to have the people that are making the decision in front of you have your, um, have your 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 arsenal. <laughs> yeah, have your arsenal already prepared ahead of time. Uh, there is no. It's like okay, guys, you know, and gals, ladies and gentlemen, you know, there is no way uh, that we're going to cover everything that we have in this in this ten minute meeting. So let me just give you a couple of pieces of eye, not really eye candy, but whatever. Uh, uh, try to grab your attention with what I've seen uh, at, at the forefront. OK, I'm just going to hit the highlights. And um, these are eight measures that I have seen in, in this data that I feel that you should pay attention to. Unfortunately, we don't have time. We've only got 10 minutes. So. Here are a couple of highlights for you. All right. Here's the other eight. This is um, the path that I'm that I'm going here. And um, here's a couple of links that you can look at afterwards. Let me direct your attention to X, Y, and Z. And that way you have peaked out. I just hit the edge of my laptop. Sorry about that. No, it is not an earthquake in Raleigh. Okay. That, <laughs> sorry about that. All right. Um, so um you lost my train of thought. Oh yeah. Uh, so you know the only thing that you ha that you can do is pique their interest, open their eyes, awaken their understanding, and stimulate their interest. If you can do those four things, 
then uh, you can leave them with the material that Stoney's talking about. Let them take ownership of it. You know, let them drill in the path that they want. You know, you can't possibly know everything that these decision makers are looking at. What is it that's going to be, as you put it, um, John David, uh, uh, salient to their decision, right? Um, uh, what is applicable to them? Okay, so have that supplemental material ready. Have that overall view. Hit the few highlights. Get their interest peaked and then let them have at it and schedule another meeting later on. Yeah, I think it's two things. So active listening and empathy. So you have to proactively kind of probe and feel like, all right, this is what they care about. This is a decision. And it might even be broader than that, like depending on how close you are to that executive or that decision maker. Right. Here's the here's the broad thing that they're anxious about this quarter. It could be that, you know, the average deal size is too low. So mm -hmm. maybe you and you pivot your analysis so that yeah. that is more that might even be the key KPI because, you know, mm -hmm. and it's going to resonate because it's going to um, catch their attention. Absolutely. Uh, you have to speak to that. You have to address those pain points, at least mm -hmm. on a high level and provide them with, with something they can, look, especially if it's a situation where you only have 10 minutes uh, before they can come uh, before they have to go away. I, I, this is an interesting question. So Nora asks, um, how do you familiar, familiarize yourself with the data if you are an entry level job or new to the company or work field? You're requested to analyze the data to get insights and facts to the decision makers. So, yeah, so that that I'm watching uh, one of my friends go through this right now. Like she she got into a, a data science role and now she is freaking out because and, and I've, I had an email like yesterday morning about, hey, I've got the job. Now what? They expect her to come in knowing everything off the bat. <laughs> well, you're a data scientist. You know it all. Right. <laughs> no, you don't. You know the facts and figures. But, yeah, you, you, you don't have the the institutional background of the organization yet. I mean, you you just barely been exposed to the landscape. You know, you you don't you don't you can hardly see the topography, much less the underlying geography as well. And and that's that that's tough. You have to start somewhere. Uh, you know, the the thing I've seen is um, uh, look at what reports they've already got available. Um, Make friends with people that are in similar roles who have been there longer. Offer your own value to them. Be willing to do some of the grunt work that nobody else wants to do. Uh, you know, you'll endear yourself to the people that don't want to do it. Uh, uh, yeah. Did I strike a chord there? Yeah. You know, be willing to do some of that stuff that nobody else wants to do. You, you, you're going to endear yourself to the others. Uh, some great flashy thing that you do, share the credit, you know, when it comes to blame and credit, right? Be willing to take the blame and share the credit and, rather than the other way around, you know, uh, deflect and reflect, right? You know, I'm going to reflect the blame back to me and deflect the credit to someone else. You know, when you're new in an organization, that's a good philosophy to have. Because that way you pull in your coworkers, your peers and your superiors, knowing that, hey, this person brings value. They wouldn't have hired you in the first place if they didn't think you could bring value. But getting with the other people that are already familiar with what's going on um, and doing a few favors for them and things, um, that's going to put you in a position where you can at least know where to probe, where to direct your efforts so that you can start studying on your own and, and take ownership yourself. So they see you as creating value. They see you as bringing value. They see you as being willing to do whatever it takes to help uh, further the mission, vision, and goals of the organization. Uh, and being willing to take some time on your own to study these things, you know. Okay, so that is what, it. that's my advice. Like like you hit on ownership and you said study on your own. Um, I think the, the concept, wh where my mind goes with this is like you need to build out mental models for how d different departments yeah. work. I, I've been fortunate, I've been, in, I've been so lucky over the past five years in that I've got to work with CFOs, CMOs, COOs, and see how their minds work. And right. then and then what's interesting is like I've almost just crowdsourced my knowledge of 
working on their consulting engagements, I get to see how, all right, well, typically CMOs, chief marketing officers, like much more striking visualizations to a CFO. Yes. They want, they want it in tabular form. They want to pull it out and start to manipulate it just off the cuff on, um, right. They're in they're, that mindset, right? They're, they're very much Excel based. That's like their kind yes. of um, paradigm for how anal analysis is conducted. Right. What you may want to do, Nora, is start taking on side projects. So either you could look for some gigs on Upwork or you could just I don't know, start working on projects or case studies that are in your specific field. I mean, I, I'm it's funny because I'm, I'm like a living testament of this and that I have never really done marketing on my own. I have I've been in the advisory role where I've advised people based on the analysis I've done, how they should spend their marketing. But over the past two months, I've actually. Uh, we we built out our own learning platform in the summer, and we're now at actively ad testing. Greensboro College has just asked me to teach digital marketing in the spring, which is interesting. And it's funny because my marketing guy was like, "You're not a marketing expert. Why are you <laughs> teaching marketing?" But I know more than like probably ninety eight percent of. Uh, well, I shouldn't say I shouldn't. I know more. They probably know like most professors probably know the text, but I don't think any of them have actually ran their own ad campaigns unless they're. Yeah. I mean, my favorite professors were the ones who worked for 30 years and came back and just wanted to teach. Those were my favorite because right. they like actually had industry knowledge. But unfortunately, exactly. like 95 percent of my professors were those who came up, got a Ph.D., never left. That Academicians. Ivory, yeah. That like ivory tower of the right. world. They know how to write papers, but they don't know necessarily what a display network versus, you know, yes. a YouTube ad I, is. I agree. I concur completely. <laughs> right. I think that there's quite a few people who uh, mistake book smarts for uh, street smarts, if you will. Amen to that. Yeah. Right. But but the whole point of that kind of like tangent is that you can, you don't need permission to start learning the things that you want to. So you can start, right. you know, and actually a great example of this is exactly what Hunter did. Find volunteer positions. So many nonprofits are just starving for people who have a lick of analytical thinking ability because most of them in the nonprofit space are like they're impact driven. You know, you talked about, mm -hmm. you know, the heart versus the head earlier. They have a lot of heart. They don't necessarily have as much of a, an inkling to let's go into the data and see, you know, what the actual impact is. They just want those anecdotal stories. So you could find yourself like um, two or three years ago, I was the in the finance committee for a local nonprofit and I was managing people who, uh, we're, we're on my committee that were way more advanced in finance than I was, but I learned a bunch. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Uh, man. All right. Stoney is, oh, Marina's Marina. Welcome. So she's, uh, thank you over, over at, at uh, Amazon. Let's see, Hunter, are you seeing any other, so we got Stoney is just, yeah, Stoney's uh, talking a lot about uh, entry entry. I like Stoney. Yeah, he he. Uh, good onboarding process for new employees, and include education about a company's product and departments. I think that might actually help, especially somebody who's starting out in the data analytics field. If you have an idea about all of about the existing data set, or like, well, so the data sets are based on those products and departments, right? Mm -hmm. So if you know about those then you have a better understanding of all the data coming in. I think that's just, it just stacks on that. Well, sure. There's, there's, uh, you were talked about, uh, John David, you talked earlier about, uh, no, uh, Hunter, well, whichever one of you said, I can't remember <laughs> about, uh, uh, yeah, no, Hunter said this about uh, book smarts versus, versus street smarts. Okay. You know, you, you understand the principles of data science. You understand that, you know, when should you look at few observations and greater observations? You know, when do you use the average? When do you use the mode? When do you use the means? Blah, blah, whatever. But then when you start, as, as you, to your point, Hunter, uh, looking at the the actual business, right? What's going on in the company? What are some of the details that are that are going on? You get more of a feel for the product. You get more of a feel for the cycles. You get more of a feel for um uh for, for what's going to happen over time that kind of helps you to know what, once you get that type of institutional knowledge built up then you can more easily tell whether or not something's going to pass the smell test right um 
you see a, a blip or a bump, you know, right? A, a blip or a dip, rather. Uh, and you're going to know, okay, yeah, that's legit or that's an anomaly or, or whatever. But that only comes from the experience of getting to know the business and what's, what's going on, what, how, it, uh, how it flows and so forth. Right. Gotcha. So for, for example, I, so with this, the, the fire data that I was working with, mm -hmm. um, there, there were certain there. So there's a call response time and then there's a call processing time and a total response time. So that's that the two, those two added together. And there were some, there were some call response times that were like 99 minutes. Obviously that's, that's impossible. Yeah, that's just, red herrings. That's just complete trash data data point. But it's like, where do you draw the line? So, it, do you draw the line at like is eight minutes too long? Is that too long of a call? Is 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 twelve minutes too long? It's like you need to you need to figure out you need to figure out with the with the organization that you're working with what exactly their normal day to day operations are like. Yes. So exactly. that you can make that data dictionary for yourself. Right. And you can tell what's a red herring and what's not. You know, what can you toss aside uh, as being way out there? It had to be like somebody left. Somebody forgot to turn off their mic or something. Yeah. Right. And, and it's a 99 minute call. Well, they were only on there for about three minutes or something. And oops, they forgot to turn out their turn off their mic or, or some stupid thing like somebody, that. Somebody somebody meant to type 99 seconds and they typed 99 minutes. Or, or yeah, that's true. Or that. Yeah, yeah. that's true. That's right. Yeah. All right, so Marina is saying number one. So this is this is the Amazon approach. So uh, Marina is, I, yeah. I believe she's a data engineer at um, Amazon or business intelligence engineer. So number one, get mm -hmm. familiar with the business first. Set up time with each stakeholder to understand their work and their metrics. I think that is fantastic advice. Um, yes. Maybe take them to lunch or a coffee, kind of make it a little bit more personal, personable, and and get to know them and kind of what's going on in their mind. Uh, number two, set up a time with the database engineer to understand the objects slash metrics on the database level. So she's kind of covering the business acumen side and then the the underlying Technical. data structure yeah. side. Yeah, I think that's I think that's fantastic. That's well, an okay. excellent combination. So Hunter, you have just started working on your first consulting and client and engagement with Silvertone Analytics. How have you familiarized yourself with the data? Because uh, I have I haven't spoon fed you this. I was just like, here's the business owner, here's Hunter. You guys have at it, and I will be here if you have questions. But I'm not I'm not gonna like mama bird chew up the worm and spit <laughs> it in your mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we we uh, this was I think last week that we that we met with uh, met with him. Yeah, yeah. So last last Wednesday or so, we went over to a. A local coffee shop in Greensboro to meet with the client, and there we talked about what his expectations were going forward. We talked about you know, he he gave us the, the the proposal that he had in mind, uh, what he wanted to get taken care of. He wanted a KPI dashboard. He wanted uh, the, a cleaned up data set, so something that where where all the aggregations and the calculated the ca the calculations and all that stuff are already correct. He doesn't want to have to go back in. And worry about if his data if his data is cleaned or not. Um, so from from there, I can glean. Okay, he's looking for he's looking for stuff that it can be used on the spot. The stuff that's practical, stuff that he can just pull out uh, when he needs it. Because he showed me he showed me that he he is uh, working with a web developer to design an app for uh, his uh, CRMs, and so that's what he's looking for out of that out of out of the work so going into that i i think like okay how can i design this to be as practical as possible to so that he can get exactly what he needs when he needs it that's kind of that's kind of what i was going for there that's how i, I but i'm I, saying but how did you find how did you get a feel for the data source you mean for like how did i examine the, the actual stuff that's in it yeah, or like, uh, yeah, yeah, like the actual data that's within it. Um, I th well, one thing that you asked for, which I think is something to tack on to the answer to Noor's question, ask for a data dictionary. Yeah, so I well, I came into the meeting. Um, we so before prior to the meeting, we 
we're playing off of one Excel sheet that he sent us from the guy who was doing this before us. And uh, it was, a, I mean, it was a very great, well-designed Excel sheet. But to say that there were a few confusing data points or stuff that I just, I couldn't understand unless he told me what they were would be an understatement. There was, there was a million abbreviations here and there. Yeah. And so I went into that meeting with a list of the data points that I thought I knew and ones that I needed to explaining on. And I wanted him to familiarize, uh, familiarize my, familiarize me with what those were to him. Um, lucky for me, he was actually like five steps ahead of me and he came in with all this knowledge of the data because I think he had done a lot of the, the, the initial infrastructure work and it just became like a little bit too much for him. Um, and so he he came in, here's prior year customers, here's uh, here's current year customers, here's the retention uh, here's the retention rate, here's the defection rate, blah 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 blah. And he he really did a great job of explaining it. However, I think that oftentimes um, at, like John David, you said oftentimes that's not been your experience. Yeah, I was gonna say you got really lucky. Well, I mean, I guess it's not luck because like I was like, all right, this is a client where I think I could bring Hunter in and they will get along. And it's this this will be kind of a first experiment of like because because uh, right now I have more consult I have con I'm not actively taking on consulting work, but I'm having leads come my way. So like if I can just be like, here's here's my account manager. <laughs> Hunter right here, <laughs> who who has gaming headphones on right now. <laughs> hey, I mean, you always got to be prepared. You never know. Um, That's right. No, but also too, getting back to that point of the anecdotal. So this, the company has, I mean, they probably what have like a 300 locations across the nation, even or maybe yeah. more than that. Yeah, yeah, like 300 like locations more. all across the United oh, States. Wow. He was saying that the one guy who built out this Excel sheet took his region from like i think it was what 1 million to like 16 million or something like that yeah just like like it like just of them taking the data to drive their decisions and that was like enough of a use case for them to be like all right we need to expand this to our entire national network so that's what we're working on now but i mean uh dr perez that's exactly what you're talking about yeah it's funny because it's like in a roundabout way i just answered my own question of how do you get executives, you know, how do you pull on their heartstrings? Well, their heartstrings are tied to their money. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so like if, if you can have this one use case of, all right, this person used this, this specific regional manager had data and here are the key points that they tracked. Here are the ones that had the big impact. You should do this for your organization as well or for the rest of the organization. I think that that kind of gets into that um, data storytelling point. Absolutely. You know, you have you have your use case, right? You have your uh, visual, compelling visual representation to back up that use case. You have the trend that shows the direction in which it's going. And then you adopt that. You um, make your decision based on what factors were shown to you, the things that uh, were addressing your pain points and looking at your, you know, the, these KPIs that were going in the direction that you were intending for them to go. You've taken action. Then you see as a result, the action was a correct action to have taken. You see increased revenue or whatever goal that you're, that you're looking at. The next time around, you're going to trust maybe not trust exact measures that come your way, but more so you're going to trust the methodology. You're going to trust that line of thinking. You're going to trust that means of approach. Okay. Cause the, the, the results are going to be different. The, um, the, the, the specific visualizations that you're looking at are going to be different. Um, but if you have that framework, you have that methodology, you have that paradigm that, uh, you know, you've shifted from your old paradigm, right? And, and you're adopting one that says, yeah, I'm going to let the data drive the decision in such a way that I can grab the insights that I need. Once you've seen the results, once you've seen the success, once you've seen that uh, it does address your concerns and 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 answers your questions. And, you know, uh, I've said data is only actionable. 
if it is a if it enables you to make a decision answer a question or solve a problem uh, and if it does all three of these things and you've been successful yeah then it's going to help you solidify that mindset but with the with the same level of flexibility to know you know it may not always turn out this way but at least this is the approach we're going to take and start thinking uh, with the big picture in mind you know you, you've got to know uh, i guess um i guess it's like knowing how to blend um strategic and tactical right you have a strategic overall view of the big picture for your organization you know what your mission vision goals are you know what your overall scheme is you know the direction that you're headed in in a general way that's your strategic right then you've got your tactical where you drill in to the means whereby you achieve the strategic right so it's like drilling into the data it's like drilling into the process it's like understanding uh the underlying concerns so that you can further the mission vision and goals of your organization i mean you know that's yeah. more philosophy than data but you know you've got to have both so that you know the direction that you're going in well i would call that um a consultative sales approach and that's how I built my consulting agency yeah. is that I came in and it's almost like I had to get my Trojan horse of my first win in. And I, what I would yeah. do is I would build a very simple interactive sales dashboard, mm -hmm. then send in the prototype. And then we'd have, if we had one win off of it, then it would open up into an ongoing. Yes. Yeah. But it's like, you got, you've exactly. got to get that. You got to get that first win. That calculated, mo it's like momentum moving forward. Right. Uh, and was and, and this is kind of a, a side tangent, but like um, in my MBA program, like during our capstone course, they were like, "You always have to watch out for scope creep." Scope creep oh. is how I made my living because <laughs> what I did was I was like, "It's twenty five hundred a month for uh, a retainer for me, and I'll work on this until it's done." But the mm -hmm. thing is, like, I might work on it for ten months because we keep having win after win after win. It's like yeah. how how long of a winning streak? It's almost like a video game. It's like how long of a winning streak can <laughs> I go on? And right, then, right, uh, right. Yeah, because and then then you're being rewarded not for the hours you put in. Because at first I was like trying to get you know my hourly rate as high as possible, and then I'm realizing mm -hmm. like what that's doing is kind of putting them at the other side of the table, and it's almost an adversarial uh, situation. To where mm -hmm. if like we're we're we've agreed upon this monthly price, and if it's worth it for you, because they're they're doing the calculation in their head, like is sure. it is it worth this next project? Is it worth you know at least this this price point? And, you know, right. depending on how big the win was, yeah, it's it's either a yes or a no. Exactly. However big the win is for you is however big they see it as a win. You know, it's got to be seen as a win-win for both because, you know, you've built up that trust and you have built up the brand and knowing that John David equals success, right? <laughs> so right. when they look at it that way, then yes. Uh, and he's, yeah, I, it's not going to go beyond my price point. He is going to deliver something that will uh, address my needs and, and meet the things that I'm that I'm looking at, then each little incremental win at a time, what that's doing is not only building the reputation, but also opening the eyes of, of the client to see, OK, one, this guy can be trusted Two, the work that is being done is quality work. Three, the approach, most important, I don't care if it's John David or Hunter or Joe Perez or whoever, Take that off the equation and say, you know, whatever whatever person I choose to help me with this, I am now understanding that this type of approach is what works, regardless of who's doing it. It's just you happen to do it better than the other person. So you're the one who's going to get the gig. Right. You know, so, right. so that's just it. That's what we do. We instill with the or at least convince them by the results that we show by getting that one single initial small win. I'd rather have one little bitty small win at the start to lead to other little bitty wins and then hopefully more you know bigger wins later on than to try to wow it by pulling out all the stops and taking a bigger chance on something that's flashy or whatever you know address that pain point meet that need you know open that door and get in once you're in then you know people are convinced yes this is the right approach to take then they'll be more and, and you've been successful at it the first time around. They're going to be more likely to trust you next time around, you know? Yeah. It will. It's, it's, it's interesting because um, I, I'm realizing like there's a certain level of finesse that you need to, 
that you need yes. to have. Of, I like that. Of, Cause it's like, I want what I want, but if I tell you, Hey, give me what I want, you're going to say no. But if I kind of <laughs> mess it and like, Hey, we, I know that this is the thing you want. And I kind of nest like I win too. If we, if you get what you want, then, then you're right. It's this concept of being on the same side of the table as opposed to like, um, right. This like being adversarial, adversarial. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like the manager is trying to milk the employee for as much value as possible versus, Hey, let's, let's, let's be on the same team here. Right. And I, I think part of that yes. is like yes. just some organizations, um, like for example, I heard, um, I mean, this is a super old story, but Enron, like Enron, their company culture was the top 10% got like million dollar bonuses. The yeah. top, bo the bottom 10% got fired. And this was like right. every quarter. And it's just like, I'm sure this was before you were born, by the way. So, I, I, so they, they make us watch movies about Enron. <laughs> yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Because, Sorry, John David. <laughs> yeah. What, go, what did you, yeah. what did you, uh, what did you just, learn about it? Just, uh, you know, higher ups committing a lot of uh, questionable acts hiring yeah. hiring women of the night stuff like that <laughs> that's uh, what they're teaching in school these days oh gosh <laughs> well, it, was a, it was a movie there was a movie about oh it's a movie everything's true well, in a, a movie you gotta... it's a document no it was oh, actually well, that makes it okay well okay uh, okay but I'm, that's so, I'm messing it's with real, you it's a real thing this guy this guy was a cfo for like five years and then he dropped off the last second with a 375 million dollar Oh, I've, I've seen the golden parachute. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen the documentary. It's, it's golden wild. parachute. All right. So Marina's chiming in again to get familiar with data, uh, come to the database with a business question. For example, how many sales and department X for year? Y? Excellent. Um, you will cover this. You will this way. Cover you'll this cover yeah. three tables. What do you mean? Yeah. By, what is it? What this you mean by way. That? This way, you will cover at least three. T if you put this way at the beginning of the sentence, okay. whole, yeah. Not that I'm trying to, you know, restructure. <laughs> so wait, questions. but but you understand the sentiment? Can you can you Perfectly. unpack it a little bit? Yeah. Okay. So uh, you don't want to be. Let's see. You want to be as multidimensional as possible. Okay. The the greater um, uh, the greater number of dimensions that you can uh, that you can introduce into a data set, into a presentation, into a report, into a set of visualizations makes for a more compelling story. OK, uh, drawing a stick figure on a piece of paper versus a full uh, shaded three dimensional animated holographic draw, you know, whatever. OK, that, that's the difference. So the more dimensions that you can bring in, OK, you're talking about um sales all by itself that doesn't tell enough of a story break can you break it out by department then you can see which department's doing better or worse then you pull in the time factor what trend do you see as it's going up or down is it seasonal is it cyclical is it you know whatever uh is it linear and and so forth so with the more dimensions that you can bring it man i i, I love the way that she says that yes the more dimensions you bring in, the more robust the picture and the more impact that you're going to have with your um, visualization. All right. Um, I'm putting you in the hot seat right now. I want you to explain. Can you explain this chart? Uh, how about let's do this. <laughs> okay. Will you, exp will you tell this data story in a way that resonates with my heart as the business owner? I'm guessing you're talking to me and not Hunter. Yeah, I'm talking to you, <laughs> oh, Dr. Perez. Oh, I man. could talk him. I could talk him up all day. And... Yeah. Well, okay. okay. So let's see. Uh, well, first of all, do you understand? I it, this isn't like we haven't prepped this or anything. No, but... we have not. For the viewing audience, this is off. <laughs> <laughs> this is off the fly. So what this is telling me is that the display network, which is non-YouTube videos, so okay. videos on people's websites, or I don't know. I, it's funny because you can actually see like I'm actively doing research on like what does this stuff even mean <laughs> in yeah. real time. So it's yeah. my understanding of this is that the videos that are not on YouTube, we're not we're only getting I mean, we got twenty seven hundred views on that. Um, mm -hmm. It costs a lot more, but look at the overall conversion. So that's we're converting on clicks. So how, how would you tell this data story to me if, if you were the analyst and you were preparing for a meeting to pitch? or to not necessarily pitch, but just like explain like the strategy moving forward. Sure. Or, 
Feel free, though. I mean, if you want to say, hey, this isn't enough data or this is too off the cuff. All right. So uh, the way I would present it, I would say, hey, don't despair just because you don't think you have as many views as you think you should have. And you know what? It's costing a little bit more than you think perhaps it should. But focus on the bottom line and see that uh, the results of your investment um, is that you're you know, you're getting a much higher conversion rate uh, and that could perhaps justify uh, justify the cost and ameliorate the fa I've been wanting to use that word all day <laughs> um, <laughs> and make up for the fact that uh, you're not getting as many views as you as you think you should. Now, I admit, you know, on the on the surface, that's may not be quite enough data to make that leap. But uh, if, if that's all I had, that's how I that's how I would approach it to see, you know, if if what I'm trying to tell them is to look more on the long term than the short term, uh, while perhaps on the surface, on the short term, it doesn't look all that great. Uh, but it looks like perhaps in the long term, uh, you're going to you're going to recoup some of that cost based on the. Uh, much higher conversion rate. Yeah. Well, I mean, what, what's really striking to me is this this bar compared to this bar. I mean, right. That's yeah. just. I, I would not have. I would not have expected that. Right. So, I mean, to give you guys context, we've been running this for three days. <laughs> I mean, and see, what's wild about? Um, th I, I'm seeing this platform as like a micro startup. It's like we mm -hmm. we built it out. We built out the infrastructure over three months this summer. And now we have three courses, we're adding more, but it's just kind of like, kind of like a low effort. I, I shouldn't say a low effort. It took a lot of effort to get in, but like the leverage is it's this people take the same course. We just have to get the marketing kind of dialed in. Right. And what we're doing, it's, it's so, it's so, it's so interesting. I'm using the platform and the marketing as part of the data for my case studies of business analytics class. So they're getting to see real data in a real business. And then interpret that and then make decisions that may hurt or help the business. Yeah. And with the more data that they can see and the more trend that they can derive and the more projections that can perhaps be made based on it, then uh, uh, the, uh, the the greater the value of uh, the exercise in, in uh, ensuring that you've got the data that you need. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. Well, we're rounding out about an hour. So was there anything that you didn't get to talk about that you wanted to talk about today? Uh, how did Hunter get those amazing headphones? No. <laughs> <laughs> those if you must know, if you must know, my mother bought them for me. Wow. So. Oh, talk about hard strings, man. Yeah. Now see that that's what you need. We also you... have a new assignment for Hunter. Clean your room. It. Oh my God. All right. <laughs> Oh, good heaven. I didn't even notice that. <laughs> I so now, see if so, you wouldn't have said something, I thought you know, I wouldn't be paying attention. I thought that was one of those fake backgrounds. Or just like so. push the heap of clothes in your closet and close it. It's actually okay, so that's actually not a heap of clothes. That is a that is a poster of Tupac and underneath of that is a shoes. They're just shoes. It's a shoe closet. I feel okay. like I wasn't suspicious of the shoe boxes until you said they're just shoes. All right. Well, I assure you, <laughs> they're just they're shoes. just shoes. <laughs> yeah, look at them. <laughs> it's like you could have just said shoes. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> right. Ridiculous. Why just yeah. shoes? Yeah, yeah. So we have yeah. <laughs> LinkedIn user, what are you doing, man? Oh, <laughs> LinkedIn user. I don't want to reveal who I am. And no, that wasn't me. Show uh, yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> don't be ashamed. <laughs> so ridiculous. He's not going to come after you. Right, awesome. right. Awesome. Well, Dr. Perez, this was amazing. So how can um, people find you? What's the best way to look you up? Well, first, I wanted to thank you, uh, John, David, and Hunter, for uh, for having me on your show. Uh, I've enjoyed it thoroughly, and I, I appreciate the honor. The um, best way to get in touch with me, you can uh, look me up on LinkedIn. I'm at uh, linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash J-W-P-E-R-E-Z. You can also look up my speaking schedule and uh, itinerary and topics that I speak on at sessionize.com forward slash Joe dash Perez. That's P-E-R-E-Z. Uh, my website is drjoeperez.com. 
though it doesn't have as much on it as the Sessionize page. But I'm always happy to connect, always happy to uh, for you to reach out. If you need somebody to speak for you or you need uh, uh, help with a data analytics project, uh, glad to uh, chat about it, get some synergy going and see how we can be mutual. Muni- 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 I can't talk. I'm a speaker and I can't talk. Yeah. Mutually beneficial to each other. Try to say that three times real fast. Right? Gotcha. Well, this has yeah. been an awesome show. Thanks, Hunter, for uh, for being a good sport and a good intern. You're the man, Hunter. <laughs> and also, thanks so much for the chat, uh, for submitting all these awesome questions. It's been a, a really special one. Absolutely. See you guys. I'll see you. Bye, everybody.